Welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to um, come and hear us today. So Rachel Preslowski and I will be talking to you today about Geoscience Australia's role in the research, mitigation and advice as it relates to the environmental impacts of marine seismic surveys. So what we thought we'd do is break this up into four acts, this play of sorts. Um, I'll begin by providing you with a bit of an introduction into marine seismic surveys and their potential impacts, just to sort of set the context. I'll then hand over to Rachel, who will um, step us through some of the lessons learnt from the Gippsland Marine Environmental Monitoring Project, which was set up around an in situ seismic survey. I'll then jump back up on stage and deliver Act 3, which is um, a description of the environmental mitigation that, or the strategies that we apply here at GA to some of our marine seismic surveys. And I'll use a, a recent case on the Lord Howe Rise as a, as a case study for that. Finally, I'll hand back over to Rachel, so a bit of tic-tac-toe. And she'll provide some insights into where we see all of this moving forward in the future. So no song and dance, I'm sorry. Um, it's not my forte. Um, but act one nonetheless. So marine seismic surveys and the environment. So the impact of marine seismic surveys remains an internationally contentious topic, and this is largely due to the conflicting evidence that surrounds the, the topic and um, the perception of bias. So Rachel will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But at GA, we seek to provide impartial scientific-based evidence and advice to government, industry, and regulators. And this is to help inform decision-making on this important topic. So an important part of managing Australia's marine jurisdiction, which is a focus of Geoscience Australia, is mapping the seafloor and the geology beneath it with multi-beam bathymetry surveys and seismic surveys. Indeed, we've done this for over 50 years um, through various <laughs> programs in order to better understand our marine estate. And this has provided fundamental geological information to support things like the geological studies and, and resource exploration um, to redefine and expand our marine jurisdiction to, to the declaration of Australia's largest network of marine parks and other applications such as the search for th um, MH370. But as part of this work, it's essential that we both understand and mitigate the environmental impacts that are associated with those surveys. And we do this in a number of ways. Um, we undertake collaborative field research where possible and we apply innovative technology to assist in not only the observations of um, potential impacts, but also their mitigation and assessment. Where possible, um, as Steve's pointed out, we publish this in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and that makes it publicly accessible and available. And we also participate in national and international forums on this topic. All of this adheres to our, our science principles and folds into our marine strategy. Um, and this is in the regards to the coordinated sort of approach to our, our data acquisition and the provision of geoscientific advice. So collectively, all of that has important implications for the development and review of policy, including the regulation of seismic activity. So unlike Jacques Cousteau's title of his first underwater film, The Silent World, the ocean's not a silent world. And underwater, light travels very, very poorly, so it is a dark one. It's, so, it's absorbed so quickly that within that top sort of 200 metres with our photic zone, beyond that, we're getting into our dark, sort of, um, dark space of the ocean. Sound, on the other hand, travels almost four times faster than it does in air. And the channelling of the sound waves through the ocean allows, allows sound to travel at, at greater distance than it would otherwise um, travel through air without losing considerable energy. So it's not too much of a um, mystery, I guess, as to why animals, marine animals, rely on sound for communication. So the marine environment's filled with sounds. It's filled with both natural sounds, so from rain, um, uh, earthquakes, um, bioacoustics, wind, and anthropogenic sounds. And these can be both chronic and acute. So acute sounds like seismic surveys, um, or chronic sounds like commercial shipping. So just to hang on commercial shipping just for a moment, what you're seeing here is a, a two-week snapshot of what happens in terms of commercial shipping around our globe. 
It's increased to the point where the, it's raised the low frequency ambient sound of the ocean by as much as 12 decibels. So that's quite a bit considering how big our ocean is. The thing is that marine animals also rely on this low frequency sound for their hearing and for their survival. And this relates to their communication, their reproduction, the way they detect or avoid predators and the way they sense their environment. So both chronic and acute underwater noise has the ability to interfere with this communication. And this is a phenomenon termed masking, which is a, a biological concern. So I use this as an example because at the moment, almost 80% of Australia's international trade is facilitated by commercial shipping. So we certainly, um, maybe that's not our patch of, of, of ocean, but we certainly contribute to that footprint. So marine seismic surveys uh, remain a fundamental tool for geological research, research and resource exploration. But they do represent a significant source of acute anthropogenic uh, low frequency noise in the ocean. They typically involve an air gun array which directs high intensity, low frequency, uh, <coughs> impulsive sounds towards the seabed. And the reflection from each of those pulses is recorded by streamers of hydrophones that are trailed behind the vessel. The data is used to generate detailed images of the seafloor and its underlying geological formations. And these images are then interpreted to characterise basin geology or identify potential oil and gas reserves or risks associated with subsurface infrastructure, um, whether it be related to C, uh, CCS, carbon se sequestration, or activities related to the ocean uh, renewable energy sector. So globally, there's concern about the, uh, these anthropogenic impacts and these low frequency effects um, on marine fauna. And indeed, it was the topic of discussion at the United Nations headquarters last year in New York, which was, I, was, I was lucky enough to attend. Historically, the majority of studies on this topic, though, have focused on cetaceans. And comparatively few have targeted commercially important species. And this is particularly the case for invertebrates, which presents a little bit of an issue for fisheries uh, policy and, um, and aquaculture. What we do know is that the predominant frequency range of seismic surveys within the hearing range of all cetaceans and the majority of fishes. And it's also been shown to elicit a neurological response in some uh, invertebrates, and a physiological response in some invertebrates. Generally speaking, seismic noise has a range of physical effects. They can range from physical, so permanent or temporary threshold shifts in, our, in, in the hearing of a whale, for instance, um, to behavioural, so modification of swimming patterns, um, perceptual, the masking I just spoke about, or well, they can be indirect, so affecting the, the food source for that animal. Having said that, there's still so many knowledge gaps in our understanding about the effects of noise on, on marine fauna. And this is particularly the case for fish and invertebrates, which is why we've sort of focused on that in the past five years or so. Having said that, some of these gaps are slowly being closed, and we're starting to see a shift from studies that would historically focus on cetacean to those focusing on various life stages of a lobster, for instance, which um, showed no negative impacts right through to zooplankton. So prior to going out to the field and trying to develop a, a monitoring program around an in situ seismic survey, we did a little bit of homework first. Under the directive of our now CEO, and in response to some stakeholder concerns down the Gippsland Basin, that seismic activity was having a negative impact on the fisheries catch rates. We set out to undertake a statistical desktop study to examine if there was a relationship, not causative, but a, a cor correlation, if you like, between catch rates and seismic data down in an area that's received a lot of seismic uh, activity between 1950 and 2013. Sadly, we didn't find any clear effects from that study. But due to the inconsistent data quality and poor resolution of the data, um, nor could such effects be ruled out. So we came away from that statistical uh, experience with a, a lesson of it was going to be hard. Attacking something like this was going to be a difficult thing to do. At the same time, we embarked on reviewing the literature on what the potential impacts were of uh, low frequency sound on fish and invertebrates. We reviewed around 70 studies, highlighted data gaps, identified um, limitations, and allowed us to sort of set up a, a series of recommendations for how we address those data gaps. 
what we learned from that was that it was going to be both hard and very complex. And this complexity comes into the, to the topic when we look at the fact that there's so many animals, all the grey area here you see to your right is data gaps, where we don't know anything about the impacts of seismic on certain animals. So that adds a, a, a bit of complexity. Here we have a lobster that might show a physiological response, an adult lobster that might show a physical, physiological response to, to seismic surveys, but the larval stage of that animal does not. So it was clear that the life cycle of an animal wasn't going to be affected by seismic surveys in the same way. We've got good traction and uptake with that lit review, um, with citations, downloads, and uh, social media uptake. But like any review, as soon as you publish it, it becomes redundant. So we're looking to update that. To provide some temporal context here with our journey, you know, along the long journey of seismic impacts. So as I mentioned, in 2014, we <coughs> undertook that uh, desktop study, which was a statistical um, analysis of the relationship between catch rates and seismic surveys. We worked on the, the critical literature review in that time as well, and that sort of set us up to embark on what became the Gippsland Marine Environmental Monitoring Project. And this applied multiple methods, telemetry, autonomous underwater vehicles, um, sampling, to assess an, the impacts of an in situ se seismic survey on scallops and fish before, during, and after the survey. We managed to get the literature review published in 2016, and in 2016 and 2017, we undertook two marine seismic surveys in collaboration with the Japan Agency for Marine Science and Technology on the Lord Howe Rise to better understand its geology. Uh, and for the first time, applied passive acoustic monitoring on, that, on those two surveys. So I'll talk to you a little bit about at that in a moment. Last year, I was lucky enough to be invited to uh, sit as a panellist at the 19th meeting at the United Nations and the topic of, um, of focus was anthropogenic underwater noise. This year sees our ships at anchor, so to speak. We're not actively out doing field research, but we do have some ongoing analysis with Curtin University, analysing some of that passive acoustic monitoring data that was collected. And we've undertaken a collaboration with um, the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources to update the critical review. Where we see this going in future, very briefly, Rachel will talk about this. But we've sort of started down the slippery slope to the development of best practice for this work. So we're scoping the potential to develop best practice guidelines to guide anthropogenic underwater noise and low frequency noise that's generated by the oil and gas industry and um, the offshore renewable energy sector. So I've spoken a bit about the desktop study and the literature review. We're not going to focus on that um, from here on in. I'm going to hand over now to, to Rachel who will deliver Act 2 and provide an overview of the GEMEM project. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the field work that we did, what Andy referred to as the GEMEM project. But before I do that, I need to tell you a bit of a story, very quick. Um, our story takes place down here in the Bass Strait in the offshore Gippsland Basin. Now these red and green polygons here show oil and gas fields, and it's also an area of really active fisheries. Um, commercial fisheries catch, so scallops, lobsters, shark, fin fish, they're all caught there. Um, and so you've got these competing industries down there, so you can kind of see where this is going. Um, back in 2010, the Victorian government did a seismic survey down there. And about, about four or five weeks after, we don't know exactly when because it wasn't logged very well, there was a massive um, mortality event of shellfish, including the commercial scallops. And we do have this photo from one of the fishermen. We know what happened, but it wasn't recorded. Um, there's not much data on it, so it's all anecdotal. It did happen. We have no doubt about that. We don't know exactly where. We don't know exactly when. And we don't have the quantity, um, I guess, the quantifiable data for it. But because of that, there was obviously this initial reaction that this was all due to the seismic survey, because temporally it matched up. You know, a few weeks after that seismic survey went through, everything died. And so because of that, there was quite a lot of media coverage saying seismic survey caused scallop death, scallop in fishery negatively impacted by seismic survey. So when we came along in about 2014, um, Rob Langford led this bit, we tried to do a seismic survey down there to look at the feasibility of sequestering um, CO2 in the offshore basin. Um, there's obviously a lot of resistance from our stakeholders. We took that on board, delayed the survey, and we started to develop this project, this environmental monitoring project, which is where Andy and I came in. So that's the story behind 
the justification of the, the Gippsland Marine Environmental Monitoring Project. So the idea was before, during, and after our own seismic survey, we would look at the impacts of um, the seismic survey on commercially important species. As Andy mentioned, this was a multi-component project, so we used a lot of different discrete projects, all of which have been written up in separate reports. So I'm not going to go into the details of these and bog you down with the, I guess, often pedantic uncertainties of science, but I do need to walk you through this just a little bit so you know what I'm talking about. So these blue squares here, they represent the survey. So we have the seismic survey on top, our before, after short-term, and long-term, after long-term surveys on the sides here. And you can see the different components in yellow. So from the seismic survey, we put out four moorings and we measured the sound directly from the seismic survey at various points um, in that, that area. For the environmental surveys, we looked at fish behavior. So we got to go out and tag some gummy sharks and swell sharks and flathead and I learned that I'm not cut out to deal with wiggling vertebrates. Um, we did a bunch of scallop dredging where I did learn that I am cut out to deal with tasty shellfish for my research. Um, and we also did some un autonomous underwater vehicle imagery where we took some photos of the seafloor to try and quantify the scallop beds in situ, see how many were actually out there. On the side, I guess these are the desktop studies, we did sound modeling to complement the sound monitoring. We did a catch rate analysis because we hadn't learned our lessons from the previous time that um, Andy had mentioned. And we also did some environmental modeling where we looked at sea surface temperatures to try and tease out what was actually happening in the environment during the time of the seismic survey. So I'm just going to walk you through our results very briefly, just for about three of those proje um, projects that I mentioned. So for the shark tagging, we didn't find any evidence of impact on sharks. So that's the gummy and the swell sharks. Gummy sharks are commercially important species. You've probably eaten them as flake. We didn't find scallops in the region, or very few scallops in the region. So this photo here, we can see these kind of scallop shells there. That's probably the photo we got with the most scallops. So it's certainly not a commercial bed. And we didn't find any evidence of impact on our dredge scallops. They were tasty, though. So, conclusion. Marine seismic surveys do not cause impact, right? Simple. And it is. It's too simple. This is not right, OK? But this shows you how you can simplify the science to get, I guess, a conclusion. Th that's not wrong. We didn't find evidence of impact. But it's much more complex than that. So what I want to do now is step back and actually walk you through each one of these results that I've mentioned here but give you a little more information so that you can have some context and interpret them a little more appropriately. So, no evidence of impact on sharks. We didn't find any evidence of impact on sharks. However, most of our sharks left the study area two days after we tagged them before the seismic survey even got in the area. Some of them came back during the seismic survey, some didn't. But what this means is that we had really low sample numbers, so statistically we couldn't prove one thing one way or another. Okay, we didn't find an evidence of really strong scaring, but there still might be some, some residential changes that we couldn't detect due to the low sample numbers. So we found very few scallops in the region. That's true. So no commercial beds. Fishermen shouldn't be worried, right? Well, scallops are actually a boom and bust organism, which means their populations peak um, to really, really exciting numbers for fishermen. And then for no reason that people can, can tell, they just, they're gone. So they're what we call a boom and bust. What this means is that their populations are temporally and spatially variable and it's extremely unpredictable. So there were very few scallops in that region in 2015 when we went there. There might be commercial beds there now. So we have to put this in context when we interpret it. And then moving on to that third result, no evidence of impact on scallops. Well, we didn't look at a lot of sublethal effects, so some physiological, biochemical effects that might have a longer-term impact on the population. However, we can, this is probably one of the more definite things we can say, we did not find a sign of mass mortality. So we, didn't, we weren't trawling up empty shells like they did in 2010. Um, and there was no difference, really, between the mortality before two months after the seismic survey and 10 months after the seismic survey. Interestingly, when we started to look at the sea surface temperatures, so here you can see this is the seismic lines in 2010, and these are different scallop beds. And when you match that, Zi Huang did this, when you match this with the sea surface temperature, these are anomalies over the average, 
You can see here where we had the seismic survey happen, there was a huge peak of over one degree in temperature anomaly. So there was some warming waters then. And the scallop mortality event happened right after that. So we have this confounding potential stressor between the seismic survey and the sea surface temperatures. And it's impossible to sort that out looking at this hind casting. So really interesting. To convey these uncertainties and complexities is very difficult when somebody wants a headline. And so we found the best way to do this is actually to put it in the peer review literature. Not a lot of people might actually see that and digest it, but it is there. And so we put all of these out. Um, most of them are open access, and they are colloquially known as the scallop paper, the fish paper, and the lessons learned paper. So if you have any more desire to dig into these, I urge you to have a look at them in all their glory. So what we learned from this was that we, um, we actually got some, some good results. Um, it's not as cut and dry and yes and no, black and white, as some people had hoped. Um, but we did have some lessons learned that we are trying to apply to scientists, policymakers, and managers. And so we learned that you need to very clearly before the study identify what you're looking at. What are your metrics and what are your species? Are you trying to extrapolate from that or are you going to just keep it focused on that? You have to use consistent and standard methods. For example, monitoring sound. Everybody uses a different metric, a different unit, and they're not actually comparable. And so when you're trying to compare sound from one seismic survey to sound from another seismic survey, you can't even do that half the time because they're not using the same unit of measurement. Um, we need to manage perceptions of bias, which I'll talk about later, and we also need to understand the balance between restrictive regulations and loss of economic benefit and the conservation aspects. So it is very much a holistic, <laughs> integrated framework that this needs to be viewed in. What we also learned, I mean, we knew this, but it, it's an illustrated example about how, how these different disciplines, particularly the ones we have at GA and CSIRO, could be integrated into this cohesive framework. So, there are actually a couple of ecologists at GA, Andy and I. Um, so we helped do experimental design and identify the biological aspects of this study. There's a lot of geoscientists who helped us with the seabed characterization, which fed into the sound propagation modeling with the physics. And then all up, those three disciplines interacted to, to form an integrated impact assessment. So it was great. And then we just learned that you need to critique and um, harness existing information. So don't just do your study in isolation. It needs to be integrated in the context of what else is out there. So the really exciting thing from this GEMEM project was that we didn't just do it in isolation, park it, and be done with it. Um, we actually monitored and kept track of how it was rolled out to other programs, and we engaged with other stakeholders who were trying to roll out similar programs. So I just wanted to touch on three of those very quickly. So CarbonNet is part of the Victorian government, and they ran a um, 3D seismic survey, I think, a year ago. And before they did that, they actually assembled an advisory board for envi environmental monitoring. I sat on that, and they were very clear that they did that as a recommendation from our papers and our project. So that was lovely. And they followed everything we recommended during it. Hopefully, they will release the results, because that was the last thing we recommended. Um, but they ran the survey, and they did they didn't monitor the um, scallops and the lobsters during that time. So CGG um, is currently working in this space, and they have also established an advisory committee to do environmental monitoring. They did invite us to be a part of that. Um, we did decline due to perception of bias, which I'll, again, talk about in Act 4. Um, so that was, again, lovely to see that they were following that recommendation to have an independent advisory committee to look at environmental monitoring. And then finally, some of you might know the Australian Institute of Marine Science, the AIMS. They have a very large-scale program at the moment where they have four themes, one of which is looking at noise impacts on pearl oysters and some other commercially important species off the Northwest. We were in extensive consultation with them before they started this program to provide some advice, very candid problems that they would probably encounter, and it's been very obvious that they've incorporated a lot of what we said into their highly successful program. So that's, again, nice to see. And I will hand over to Andy now to talk a little bit more about our research, but more in a mitigation space. So I'm just going to paint just a bit of the legislation context um, in around the mitigation of, uh, of seismic surveys. So yes, GA has been um, undertaking seismic surveys for nearly half a century. And this provides us with uh, knowledge of those large scale geological structures that has been fundamental to the development of our, of our energy industry. So in doing so, GA upholds environmental standards to minimise the risk of disturbing marine life. So in Australia, the offshore and petroleum exploration and, de and development activities that lie outside state and territory coastal waters are governed by this very long named act. 
and not seem responsible for enforcing compliance with that. It, it, it involves the proponent developing a very detailed environmental plan. And then we have the potential impacts on matters of natural environmental significance for marine seismic surveys, which are regulated through the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and its associated regulations. That includes EPB Act Policy Statement 2.1, which outlines the interaction between so offshore seismic uh, surveys and whales. And that's currently under review with the Department of Environment and Energy. We're also guided by international agreements, um, several guidelines, and of course, the scientific literature. So with all that context, uh, in 2016 and 17, GA collaborated with the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology, JAMSTEC, and undertook uh, two marine seismic surveys to better understand the geology of the central Lord Howe rise. This required a large volume, a 7,800 cubic inch volume array uh, required to map the full crustal thickness of the, of the Lord Howe rise. So in preparing our EPBRC referral, we worked collaboratively with Curtin University to have them undertake some acoustic propagation modelling. And this was to help us predict the potential ranges for impacts on whales. What that modelling showed us was that sound propagation levels were going to be sufficient enough to cause physiological damage to the, to the whale's hearing, so permanent and temporary threshold shifts, very, very close to the source. But behavioural ex responses extended much further, so beyond 250 kilometres away from the source for low frequency and uh, mid frequency whales. And, for, and quite close to the source for high-frequency whales. An example of those high-frequency whales are sperm whales, and they were um, predicted to occur and had been sighted out across that region. Just so we can focus on the sperm whales, just a little bit of background. Um, they're a beautiful animal. They're the largest toothed whales in our ocean, the largest predator. They have an almost cosmopolitan distribution, so they're all over the ocean. They can dive up to three kilometres below the sea surface, and that makes them the second biggest, uh, deepest diver uh, next to beaked whales. They have a bushy blow from a nostril that's located to the left-hand side of their melon, and this makes identification of this animal really easy at the surface because they aren't there often. You can hear that faintly. So they use low-frequency click vocalisations called coders to communicate, and this is most likely achieved via the... Um, uh, and and helps them with their echolocation of prey, which is achieved by the, the spermaceti organ. So globally, their foraging habitat is beyond 400 metres water depth, um, along continental slopes and ridges, and areas of high product, primary productivity and bottom relief, because all of this equals high concentrations of meso and bathypelagic squid, which is what the sperm whale feeds on. So if we look at the seamount chain off the east coast of Australia, it's not surprising that they have been sighted out in this region. But having said that, apart from those four sightings, very little data existed on the distribution and abundance of sperm whales in this region. So we saw it as a bit of a research opportunity. So given the size of the seismic system and the potential for disturbance, GA adopted passive acoustic monitoring. And this allowed for the real-time detection of whales and um, the monitoring of those vocal species. We also applied additional management procedures, so we extended um, shutdown zones and precautionary um, zones, uh, had marine mammal observers on board, and we timed the survey outside of known migration periods. So PAM proved a very effective tool on both these um, seismic surveys and allowed our decisions to be consistent when those whales were within our mitigation zones. It also allowed us to monitor whales when they weren't at the surface, which for sperm whales is a lot of the time, and in poor weather and at night. All up, sperm whales accounted for 70% of the sightings, so they were most certainly out there, and resulted in six seismic operation shutdowns. So the point being here that it really had both operational and environmental benefits. So environmental benefits for the animal, operational benefits in the sense that you can track an animal entering your mitigation zone, but you can also track an animal exiting your mitigation zone, which enables um, more efficient operation. What are we doing with all of this data? We're analysing it in collaboration with Curtin University, and this will help facilitate a bit of an assessment of the behavioural responses of these whales to such a large seismic source. It also helps us understand the distribution and abundance of this important species out in the southern coral sea, 
It allows us to model and predict the spatial extent to which um, important geomorphic features such as the Lord Howe Rise and Gifford Seamount act as critical habitat for whales and other migrating species. All of this has important implications for the regulation of seismic uh, surveys and the management of these marine parks. But I guess what we worked away from um, having gone through th this sort of experience was uh, an appreciation of mitigation, not just being about compliance, but it's about it being an opportunity to fill knowledge gaps, improve standards and inform your regulation. And this is where we've um, stepped into the best practice space. It also highlighted the importance of applying new technology and embracing innovative science to address some of these issues. So there's such an advancement in, in a range of different uh, marine imagery throughout the world. This is an example of what's called an Uduku out of Jams Tech. It's a very cheap camera system that can go down to the deepest depths of the Earth's oceans. So 10 kilometres down, we can still apply this technology and look at um, potential impacts of things like seismic surveys or deep sea mining, for example. So with that, I'll thank you and hand over to Rachel. All right, so the last bit here, I want to talk about some of the broader issues for this project and ways in which we're moving forward and, and kind of, I guess, tie a nice little bow in it, even though it's definitely not a nice little bow. So looking at the broader measures of impact, anytime we do a scientific study at GA, it's great. We're contributing to scientific excellence, but we are also an applied science agency, and so we need to be measuring our impact and how it fits into the broader sphere and public good. And so we've had a few, I guess, metrics of that that have been successful over the last few years. I'm just going to walk through a few of them here. Um, one of them is that the offshore regulator NOPSEMA um, heavily cited our review and used a lot of our recommendations in their information paper that they put out to the petroleum industry earlier last year. Um, we were also involved in the review process for it, so it was really nice to, to be recognized um, in that space that we were a good provider to government um, for advice on this. We contributed to a SCAR paper, which is as of yet unreleased, but hopefully will change at some point in the future. Um, and this was an update on looking at the um, impacts of anthropogenic noise in the Southern Ocean. So again, using the skills that we developed during our, our research um, and applying it in the Antarctic context. Um, we've been in a, a few high-level meetings now. So Andy's mentioned the UN one. I like that photo because he looks so professional and UN-y. <laughs> Um, we've been reviewing a lot of papers, which seems really trite and something that we all do, and it's kind of that burden, you know, you take, no, I don't have time, I don't have time. But for us, we found that reviewing a lot of these papers in this field that are coming in really put us on the front foot for knowing what's being done out there before it's actually released, before the media gets hold of it, before it's even out in the, the journals. And so this is really fed in nicely to some of the, the work we'll be doing in a minute. I just like this cartoon here because I, I got a reviewer three the other day. And yeah, it's just, yeah. We, we try not to be reviewer three. We're more reviewer two, I think. But, um, but again, it just gives us kind of that inside knowledge on what's going on and what's being done. And you know, we, we know a few studies are going to be released over the next year or two, which will, again, rock the boat in this field. So this is actually fed into our current work with Department of Agriculture, um, in which they want us to update our 2017 review. Now, because we know a lot of the stuff that's waiting in the wings to be published due to our work on internal reviewing, we are well placed to, um, to update that review. Now, I want to talk a, a bit about managing perceived bias. We've hinted at this a bit throughout this presentation. For me, this was a really interesting topic, um, kind of got me in that communication space, which I love. I'm not talking about bias here. That's a scientific ethics issue, okay? I'm not, I'm not touching that. I'm talking about the perception of bias, which is, for GA, we are a seismic operator. We've done a lot of marine seismic surveys through history. We have this perception of bias, of being in bed with industry, of being favorable towards seismic surveys. It's not, it might not be true, but that's the perception, and we need to acknowledge that. That's real. That's what people often think of us. And so we did that during the development of the Gippsland Marine Project, um, and we were conscious of it throughout. And so we actually took steps throughout the duration of the project to manage this perception of bias. And we've actually advocated that other people in similar situations do these same steps. So one of those are um, during the planning, we formed a project board. And this had high-level representatives from all the major sectors, so fishing, petroleum industry, state government, and um, academia, and federal government. 
So it didn't make for an easy meeting often, but it did mean that you had all the main interests represented in that board and that you could flag issues as they came up and mm, I guess modulate your communication strategy according to what, what was being identified during those meetings. During implementation, we made sure that we didn't do everything ourselves. We developed a really good collaboration with CSIRO and some independent contractors um, and some universities to help ensure that we had this, um, I guess, good reputation of collaboration and not just a GA project. During the review process, we made sure that we, we got some external reviews. Some were really difficult. Some were reviewer three. I think actually we had a few reviewer threes. Um, the, you know, the big nasty fish that just came in and told you everything you did wrong. But it was good because then we could go back, fix it or acknowledge it and, um, and really, I guess, play on those strengths. And then finally at the end, we made sure that everything was transparent. We released everything through peer review journals, through um, data on the NCI, um, through different links. And so that made it seem like we weren't hiding anything. We weren't. And we had this really nice, I put this up here because it's just a nice quote from the guy who owned the fishing company um, who was initially really um, embedded in the media during that 2010 mortality event. He was all over the, the media then saying seismic killed our scallops, seismic killed our scallops. Well, this is what he said at the end of our project. Um, so that was a really nice validation that we did something right. I want to shift another tangent that I want to indulge for a second. Um, we learned a lot about this topic in the media. And marine seismic is by no means the only topic that GA deals with that can be a bit contentious and sensitive. And so I kind of wanted to draw attention, I guess, we all know what's happened in the media and what happens, but I, I wanted to articulate it a bit in the context of our research. And so I've just got some headlines that I'm going to show that use various different media tactics. So we're not going to change the media, but we can be aware of it. Um, so sensationalism, so that's pitching a story, perhaps in an oversimplified way, um, to provoke a reaction, sometimes at the expense of accuracy. And so you can see that one there. Um, that study wasn't that clear, but that was the headline that came out of it. Emotive language, so just simple things like using blasting. It's, that's an emotional term. Um, animals pay the price, that's again emotional. There's nothing wrong with it, this is how the media operates, but we need to be aware of it. As scientists, it helps us. Um, cherry picking data, cherry picking studies to support a particular agenda. You can find anything out there. Any parents in the room, if you go on the parent blogs, you can find whatever you want to do to support how you're rearing your child. It's great. Same with science. You can go into the headlines and find whatever you want to support your claim. That's not science. So for these things here, they picked the results that showed negative impacts. Um, they kind of ignored our studies, which were done at the same time, which weren't as exciting, I guess, because they didn't show anything. Or you can just ignore it. So this is an example from the petroleum industry. They wrote an entire article here about how seismic contractors or seismic surveys are on a bit of a downturn. They're hoping for a turnaround. In nowhere in this four-page article was there any mention of the fact that that might be due to increasing public awareness of environmental impacts. They just ignored that completely. Um, so those are just different tactics that we've noticed in the media that um, are prevalent to this topic and probably quite a lot of others. So moving back to our, our research, away from my communication tangents, um, we will be in the next, what, two months, Andy? Three months? We'll be updating our 2017 review, um, and that's um, due to a contract with the Department of Agriculture who wants uh, updated um, knowledge that they can use for, for their stakeholders. Hopefully from that we will find funding um, to develop a best practice in the future. And this is basically taking everything that we've talked about and learned and applying it to industry and other sectors so that they can follow a best practice um, and they know what to do and they know what they should be doing and they know how to communicate that clearly. Um, first and foremost of that is developing standards. So I touched on sound monitoring and how there's different units. We, we need a standard for that. We need standards for calibrating our sound equipment. Um, we need standards for how you're actually measuring the sound and how you're measuring the impact and how you extrapolate to other species and other regions. And we don't have that. We have made some really good headway through the Nest Marine Biodiversity Hub um, and Seabed. There's been standards developed through that. So we are in that space now and we can apply that to this particular topic. 
Application to renewable energy, this is really exciting. So just, I think it was last week, the Minister for Energy approved the exploration of the Gippsland for the purpose of an off offshore wind farm. They need seabed knowledge for that, so seabed mapping. They also need to know how um, the noise impacts from the infrastructure building itself, so the pile driving, and the actual wind turbines themselves might affect the marine fauna. That's very similar noise to the seismic stuff. It's low frequency and it can be acute. Pile driving is almost the same um, as, as some of the seismic impact or seismic survey. And so we can take our knowledge base that we built for this kind of study and potentially apply it to um, offshore energy um, in regards to the, the wind farms. And then finally, we, we need to be continuing our collaboration with all the sectors. We've done well at this and we need to continue to engage with them equally. So the take home messages. So it's not necessarily the science messages here, but it's what we learned as project managers in this and as, um, I guess, advocates of making your science relevant to government. And so what started as initially a fairly small scale project ended up having national and international impacts. And that's great. That's really good for us. It's a bit intimidating. Um, a bit scary if you had told us this was going to happen at the beginning, we might not have agreed to do it. But yes, yeah, it's, it's good. Um, discipline specific research at GA. So what started as an ecology project ended up having really broad impacts in non-target sectors. And they should have probably been target sectors in the beginning. Now that we know that, we know how applicable it can be um, in a broader respect. And then these last three points were one GA. I wanted to relate it to three out of four of the pillars. See, Laura's there, so she can feed that back to James for me. Um, so I want to talk, fostering positive organizational culture might seem a bit left of center, but this whole issue is really sensitive and hard and challenging. And often as scientists, we just distance ourselves and we don't acknowledge that emotive aspect of it. It is emotive and we need to acknowledge the public's feelings about this and that it is legitimate. And as scientists, we can come in with that evidence base and we can try and help. You know, we're, we're providing one area of an integrated framework to assess these things. So I think, you know, if we're a little more open and transparent about the challenges we face sometimes with these sensitive issues, that can help us all. Um, enabling supportive stakeholders, we looked at fisheries, petroleum, conservation, um, even renewable energy. So we're trying to, you know, work with all of them equally. And then finally, pursuing science excellent. We didn't just do the project and park it. We published it, we promoted it, and we're trying to make it relevant to, again, all those different sectors. We have a cast of characters to acknowledge, um, some of whom are in the audience. We thank you very much. And um, yeah, if you want any more information, chat with Andy or I, or we've got a little web page, which is buried in GA's website. Um, so best thing to use the QR code or ask Andy or I where it is. Thank you very much.